Thanks, Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the President, the Vice President for the invitation to be here, and also the Transform team. Um, it's always very nice to be able to share the research work we do uh, at the European Commission's Joint Research Center. Um, I, ha I know quite a few of you because we work, we try and work in collaboration with the community, with the universities, with different countries uh, as the Commission. But it's also true that I, I don't know many of you and I really hope this is going to be a nice experience of interchange, that we exchange some knowledge here. Okay, so um, I, think, I think it was important to start positioning um, open education within the political agenda of the European Commission. We all know it's a very popular term, you know, it's very fashionable nowadays to talk about open education, to talk about open educational resources, but it's also true that it's an important part of the political agenda. Uh, in 2013, the Commission launched a communication called Opening Up Education, in which uh, the importance of open educational resources was mentioned uh, in terms of advice to member states to start thinking further about it. Um, but also, um, open education is one of the six new priorities of education training 2020. It's actually priority number three which is open in innovative education and training, okay? So whenever we are talking about and dealing with open education, we are actually also hitting some political agenda that we have here um, for Europe. Now, here's the question. What is open education? What is open education, by the way? Don't look. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever asked this question to your colleagues or, or to, to your workmates. Um, but I've tried asking this question many times before to different audiences. And the answer varies. To some people, open education is open educational resources. Oh, yeah. are, okay? To some other, it's all about MOOCs, right? And to some others, it's about open science, no? Open, opening up repositories, open access. But then we think actually, why not? Open education is all about it. It's about OER, it's about open science, it's about uh, repositories, but it's more than that. At least that was our perception. Um, uh, the evidence that came from our research showed us that whatever you ask what open education is, you're going to have different questions, different answers to the same question. This is why we needed a working definition for open education. And we call our, our definition of open education an umbrella term because it can fit into it whatever definition you have. If it's comprising OER, if it's comprising uh, um, open access or MOOCs, for example. So yes, it is a very broad definition and we did it on purpose, okay? We built it together with a number of experts and the definition actually emphasizes one important aspect, which is the bridging between non-formal and formal education. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit today. As you can see, a variety of access routes to formal and non-formal education. Um, open education is also important for modernizing education, for transforming education, which is at the core of this event today. And it's mostly enabled by digital technologies. So actually, when a university starts practicing open education at different levels, what they notice is that really some transformation from the core. Also in the way the students learn, in the way the teachers teach, but in the way the leadership understands the role of technology within the institution. So we wanted to have some sort of shared understanding for open, uh, open education. And the most important thing is that uh, all the work we do, uh, at least so far within the Open Edu project, is to help universities to come up with a strategy for open education. Because what we realize is that there are many ad hoc experiences. So there is a department dealing with OER, for example, another department dealing with research, but there is no strategy. It's all very experimental, which is okay, because if it's something new, we need to experiment, right? But the lack of a strategy sometimes um, uh, makes open education a bit more difficult uh, to be seen uh, within the institution itself. So therefore, sometimes what you have is little collaboration 
a little sharing of experiences. And this is why this event today is a great opportunity to deal with it. So, one of the messages that our research shows, I'm going to show you in a minute, the research design that we have, is that the lack of transparency in the strategy makes collaboration opportunities less visible, okay? The main message, I'm starting with the message, is that universities should consider having a strategy for open education, which is part of the university's mission. Okay? That it's not an isolated practice, but something that is embedded at the university's mission. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the results of our research. The Open Edu project uh, was a project that is started in 2013. It was running up until the beginning of this year. And it, was, um, it came up in support to the communication, to the Commission's communication I mentioned before. It's a mix of qualitative and quantitative methods of research. So, for example, the first two studies here, open cases and open thread, are qualitative based studies. So they are about case studies, they are about interviews, okay? The other two, open survey and MOOC knowledge, they are quantitative studies. They are about surveys, as the name says itself. And MOOC knowledge is a project in which uh, WOC is a partner, by the way, and it's about studying MOOC learners. So very briefly, in open cases, we ran nine case studies because we wanted to understand in depth um, the practice of uh, coming up with a strategy for open education. So if you're interested in I'm going to talk about all of them in a minute, but just uh, in a nutshell, if you want to know um, the challenges uh, that the universities went through when setting up an open education strategy or a department, then open cases brings interesting cases for you to read, okay? Open Cred is about recognition of non-formal learning, of MOOC certificates, OER certificates, etc. So we studied a little bit of this aspect of recognition as well. Open Survey is a survey of five countries. I'm going to show you. I'm going to start by showing Open Survey. And MOOC Knowledge is a study in which many European universities are part, and you can still join. I think there's um, another year to go before the results are published. And it's a study of all MOOC learners. We wanted to know what learners can do uh, with the certificates when they finish a MOOC. What can they actually do? Does it help in the labor market or not? Is it only for personal knowledge or not? So we try and follow MOOC learners over time to understand better the results of studying with non-formal learning. Okay, so this is the research design of the Open Edu project. Apart from the studies in which we work with different universities across Europe, different collaborators, different contractors, because we really try and engage the community as much as we can, we have in-house research. So we always carry out literature review, desk research, and we bring people over to the APTS for workshops. Uh, I'll show you in a second. Um, an event that we had in the beginning of this year, very similar to this one, in which we had the presence of uh, rectors and vice rectors of 19 European countries discussing this framework that I'm going to show you in a second. All of this together helped us to come up with the final report of the Open Edu project in which we present the framework the Open Edu framework. This framework was designed specifically to higher education institutions, okay? It can be customized to basic education if needed, if you wanted, but the public, the audience for this framework is higher education institutions, particularly managers or anyone in charge of developing strategies or ma of making decisions at a university level, okay? Uh, okay, open survey. It's the survey of five countries, France, Germany, Spain, Poland, and the UK. Um, the data was collected in 2015, and we published this, this report um, this year, in 2016. Okay, here we go. Um, so we asked different questions. So this is why we needed to define open education, first of all, okay? Because otherwise we wouldn't be able to run the survey. And it was a representative survey. So we asked to universities of these five countries, 
do you, what different forms of open education do you have? Do you offer open education at all? In this case, it could be open access to research, it could be OER, it could be MOOCs. And overall, we had 39.4% of universities of these five countries saying that yes, they offer some sort of open education. Let's check the Spanish data. 43.4% of universities do offer some sort of open education. So and so forth. UK is still leading here because UK was right in the beginning of this OER movement, no open education movement, uh, in the beginning of the year 2000. So yes, there is movement towards, heading towards open education, and then we can interpret it as, as we want. You can say, oh great, you know, we, we are nearly 50% of universities in Europe, uh, of these five countries that are very big, doing something about it, or perhaps you say, well, we are not yet 50%, but, you know, we tend to look at it in a very positive way, okay? Okay, here we go, oh, we are now. How many of you uh, work with OER? I think a few of you said you work with OER in particular, no? So OER, basically we asked, we differentiated use and production, okay? So we had use, um, did anyone ask? No, okay. 51.4% of universities actually use OER, but a smaller number actually develop and use. This is data from, from our research, which is interesting, no? Uh, and in fact, it has to do with some other research also say reuse of OER is always more difficult, no? Development and reuse. 10% uh, of out of these five countries are, they don't, they say they don't do anything about OER, but they're thinking about it. The other thing is, universities tend to ask us, but what are the benefits of open education? Uh, making MOOCs cost a lot of money, yeah? Uh, we have to invest lecturers' time, technicians' time. We have to be able to improve uh, our strategies for, for video classes, uh, come up with new technologies. Okay, we learn a lot in this process. We modernize our teaching in this process, but it costs a lot. So some studies actually try and, and, and explain how you could make a, a low-cost MOOC, which we know can also be possible. But overall, universities tend to worry a lot in relation to the investment they have to make uh, to offer, to be engaged with open education. But in fact, as you can see over there, we found out that out of these five countries, 23% 23 of universities had found some sort of business model, okay? And some of them even argue that they've made some return on the investment. So if you read the Open Cases report, you can find some of them there, okay? Um, benefits, more student reach, increased enrollment, and that's data that we've known for nearly 10 years now. Um, external fund, it normally attracts external fund, uh, and some sort of small income, okay, like um, commercializing certificates, for example. Um, so if you are still in doubt how to, how to think of open education in terms of how can I get some return on investment if that's what you're after, uh, we have some experiences in there uh, in the report. Now, 51.4% um, of universities use OER, 32 offer. Uh, some of them um, offer MOOCs as part of the institutional strategy, use them in the teaching on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, others focus more on external students because they want to get more enrollments. 32.2% have a policy or mission statement mentioning open education, which is something that we said would be interesting for universities to do. And one important um, item also is about collaboration in MOOC recognition. This tends to be seen as the most difficult part of open education, recognizing non-formal learning. And in these countries, 41.4% of universities say they can recognize certificates issued nationally. But it's interesting that 3.9% also recognize cross-border, okay, transnational certificates. But this is also something very new, and we are still studying and, and looking for uh, new experiences to be able to report more on that one. So the framework uh, was designed not to bring definitive answers, okay, to, to tell you how to do open education, far from it. 
really far from it. But what I wanted to do is to come up with some ideas so that uh, any university interested, any lecturer, any decision maker could have the framework as a tool to self-assess the university and to make decisions. Okay? The framework is fully customizable. You can change whatever you want. You can add whatever you want. Um, and imagine, this is the visual representation okay, of the framework. Imagine that if you clicked, if you could click um, into each of these dimensions, the framework would bring you more information. A definition for each one of them, a rationale for each one of them, and it has over 150 descriptors of possible practices that we gathered through our research studies that I showed you before, all the four studies that I showed you before, okay? So, you obviously, I'll show you in a second, you can take and say, my university already does this, does this, or my university doesn't do this, this, and this. It's absolutely fine. And what we say is great. At least you know why you've chosen root A instead of root B. It's just a tool for critical thinking. Let's put it this way, right? Okay, interesting to see here is that leadership is, a, is one of our dimensions, right? So we have the first six dimensions here. We call them the core dimensions. And the other four, Technology, quality, strategy, and leadership are the transversal dimensions of open education. Why is that? Because um, you can, when you think about um, uh, the core dimensions, for example, in content, question, what is OER? You could ask me, Andrea, what, is, what are MOOCs? What is OER in this framework? I can't see it. You're talking about open education. I can't see MOOCs in your dimensions. Yeah, did you notice that? Why? Because the way we created this is to show some interdiscursivity of these dimensions. They don't work in isolation, okay? One dimension depends on the other. So you can't only have content without having technology, without having some sort of leadership, without having pedagogy. So it's a global view of open education, really to modernize, to transform the university, having openness at, at its core, okay? So MOOCs, for example. MOOCs bring content. MOOCs bring new pedagogies. They can, each, they can offer the possibility for certificates that can be recognized. They um, provide us with opportunities for collaboration internally and externally with other universities. There are opportunities for research, you know, um, a lecturer may be interested in researching the outcomes of uh, the MOOCs they offer, for example. And it improves access, you know, increases access to education. It may be part of the university strategy, and this is what we say, open education, MOOCs, OER, everything should be there in the mission. It depends on technology, it needs to have quality in order not to damage the reputation of the university, in order to please the, the, the students. And the most important also part is leadership. And in there, if you go in there later and have a look, uh, we have the scriptures for all possible um, leadership practices that we've found. And leadership can come from top down and bottom up, okay? Leadership from people like you who can come back to your universities and say, hey, let's do this. Let's try this one out, this practice, this strategy. How about including all open education in the mission? But also leadership coming from lecturers coming from the students, coming from the community itself, okay? And, and we try and explore all this in the framework. Now, the other thing that the report brings towards the end, besides presenting the framework, is a template. You know, just a template that helps you to deal with the framework itself, that helps you to go through the framework, okay? What you wanted to, to come up with was a tool. A tool for university, to add practices, to customize, to choose the dimensions they prefer to focus on. Although, one of the recommendations that we passed towards the end of the report is that um, universities should have a holistic view of open education. Instead of focusing only on OER, only on pedagogy, which is actually very difficult no? in, in open education, but try and look at it in this holistic view, having the 10 dimensions in mind when coming up, when proposing a, st a strategy for the university itself, okay? If you go to the report and you access the content dimension, for example, you will find, this is just a, a, a zoom in, 
into the, into the report. A definition, a rationale, the components that are part of, the, of this um, dimension. And if you see, for OER, I think it's very important to say, we defined content as part of the content dimension, both open educational resources, which are licensed content that can be reused, shared, etc., and free of charge content, okay? Um, because we noticed that many universities, uh, or when they offer MOOCs, for example, they do not license openly their MOOCs. And here's the question. There are many people that will shout and say, free of charge content cannot be open education, but we disagree. We disagree because if you look more globally, in terms of what you want to do, what you want to get out of it, if you want to make access possible, if you want to let someone learn because they want to move forward in their career and they are not really interested in reuse, for example, okay, it's absolutely no problem. Free of charge content, fully accessible, in our perception, coming out from our evidence, is part of open education. Although, yes, we recognize the importance of license and we do suggest and we'd really like to see all content available with an open license, obviously, okay? But we cannot, we cannot ignore the reality. It's clear to us that in most countries um, that there is still some resistance towards uh, fully licensed content and we acknowledge that. Okay, the second uh, study is the open cases, the one I mentioned before. We have actually two publications that came out from this study. One of them is the in-depth case studies, in which we present nine experiences, nine cases. Eight are from universities in Europe, and one case belongs to a company, a private for-profit company in Ireland. And we also have a mini catalog of case, a mini, mini cases catalog. This one just brings, brings 50 cases. Uh, for example, if you're looking for experiences with repositories, we have mini cases showing universities that are focusing on repositories. Um, cases on open science, we have their mini cases showing you examples around Europe on open science, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is just a catalog that you can flick through and see uh, if there is anything you'd like to read further. Open cred is the other study focusing on recognition, recognition of the certificates of non-formal learning. Um, this was again a qualitative study uh, based on four cases. It can already be downloaded if you are interested. And here's the research design of Open cred. We carried out research. Uh, that was also back in 2000, um, end of 2014 when we started this study. We wanted to know the cycle. We wanted to have a perspective of a lecturer that was offering MOOCs, recording MOOCs, you know, having their storyboard for their, for their MOOCs. Then the, pers the perspective of the learners taking that MOOC. And then when the learners finished, the perspective of the employer, you know, if they wanted to include that MOOC in their CV and present it to an employer, how well would an employer receive this? So we, we were actually interested in this triangle, but it was very difficult to find back then and probably still is right now. So we present in-depth interviews with the MOOCs, MOOC learners, and um, employer bodies. And six things came out, most important things that came out from this study. That one issue is the identity verification of the learner. Um, and then suitable supervised assessment. So there was an occasion in which a student said, you know what, it's actually expensive. I did the MOOC, but it's expensive to get the certificate. Because for me to get the certificate, I have to pay for it. And um, if I want to make the certificate valid, I have to go to the university and do uh, the assessment face to face, okay? If the, the learner was explaining uh, that for him, uh, he realized that um, uh, employer bodies would only accept it if he could prove that he studied online, but that he took the exam uh, on campus uh, under supervision, okay? And that would make the certificate more valid, which is an interesting perspective. We also noticed that the terminology, uh, people use those terminologies very interchangeably in the field. And we are here saying that credentials, we thought, we thought it was important to, to, 
to come up with these um, definitions a bit more clearly. Uh, the credential is, is the, uh, the accrediting. No? You, you have a certificate accredited by a university. It says it's valid. But the recognition is something that can come after. It can come, for example, once the student has accreditation, has a certificate. The recognition comes from a different institution, for example, not always from the same institution which issues the certificate. So thank you very much. And if you have questions, I hope we can, we can discuss them.